Okay. Well, greetings. Welcome today to Hot Spots I See in Local Churches with Pastor Jack Lynn, who is a Wesley Seminary alum. You may hear me say that about 100 times in the next hour or so. So hope you're not, uh, hope you don't get tired of that. But I'm very excited about today's presentation, as I've been telling Jack, uh, I've been making the rounds to the different district conferences in the last month or two, and I literally have had multiple conversations with our students and our alum, other pastors, about each of these topics that, that Pastor Jack is going to address today. So I'm very excited for those of you watching and those that will be watching this recording. They're very, uh, very timely, very applicable uh, points that Jack uh, will be sharing with us today. So today's event is part of the Wesley Seminary webinar series with the goal of resourcing the local church, including our students and alum. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a Q&A session after Jack's presentation. Please enter your questions in the Q&A forum at the bottom of your screen, and he will answer as many of those as time allows after the presentation today. Now, Pastor Jack Lynn, Wesley Seminary alum, <laughs> served at Central Wesleyan Church in Holland, Michigan, as both the worship pastor for 17 years and the executive pastor for 10 years. He left there in 2006 to launch Clear Vis Vision, which is a church consulting ministry. He's been, he has been doing church consulting for 15 years in a variety of denominations, including the Wesleyan Church, the Reformed Church, or Christian Reformed Church, Free Methodist, and Baptists. Now, Jack is currently doing consulting work with the Great Lakes uh, region of the Wesleyan Church with his colleague, Sue Tietzma, who joins us today. And uh, they work together to oversee pastoral transitions in the Great Lakes region. So we're excited uh, for Sue to join us as well. Now, Jack, uh, to practice what he preaches, literally, is also serving as the interim lead pastor at Red Cedar Church in Rice Lake, Wisconsin, as if he didn't have enough else to do. <laughs> Uh, Jack is married to Michelle, and they live in Holland, Michigan. They have four children, three of whom are married, and they have one grandson. Now, Jack's favorite food is, can anybody guess, drum roll, ice cream. That's right. <laughs> favorite food in the world is ice cream. Jack, any certain, certain flavor that you prefer? Well, uh, chocolate chip cookie dough would be at the top of my list. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent choice. But I like any kind of ice cream that doesn't have nuts in it. <laughs> I agree with that completely. Well, it's my distinct honor today to welcome Pastor Jack Lynn. Thank you, Pastor Jack. Thank you very much, Joel. I'm excited to be with everybody today, and I'm going to share my screen, and we'll just jump right into this, and I'll look forward to your questions and things that we can, we can dialogue about uh, along the way. Uh, at, at, at the end of, the, of our time together. So I will look very forward to that. I'll just jump into this and uh, just share with you that um, one of the things that uh, is a reality is when, when you do church consulting and you're in different churches and different parts of the country and different uh, denominations, different settings, you do run into some things that, um, uh, you know, you start seeing some common things that happen in churches. So when Joel asked me about uh, doing this uh, webinar, I, I just began to think about what are some of those common hot spots I see in local church. This this has been a, the, the weirdest 18 months that we've ever had in the church world in my lifetime with the impact of COVID, with the racial tension in our country, uh, with the presidential election challenges, with the mask, no mask thing, lots and lots of challenges. The things that I'm going to talk about today are not related to just this year. They're longer term hot spots that I see in the local church. And so I'll just go through this, make comments about each one of these things, and then look forward to your questions as we get to the end of this. So the first hot spot that I want to talk about is a need to reinvigorate focus on mission, creating an outward focus in the church. You ask a church leadership body what they believe is the primary purpose of the church and see what kind of response you get. I always find it very interesting. I get lots and lots of different responses, uh, some of which you wonder if they got off the back of a cereal box or something. Um, there, there's we have lost a sense of focus on what the mission of the church is. Why did God create the church? 
Do church leaders both understand and fully embrace the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, the passage of Scripture in Acts 1-8 and Luke 19-10, where Jesus said he came to seek and save that which is lost. Uh, and, and the fact is, what I encounter is lots and lots of church leaders have lip service to this, but don't fully embrace what it means to live this out. So in the book, Winning on Purpose, John Edmund Kaiser says, why does our congregation exist? And he says, there's three possible answers. Number one, for us, the people inside. Number two, for others, the people outside. And number three, for both. Now, I'm, I happen to be a fan of John Edmund Kaiser and the book, Winning on Purpose. And so uh, he says this, if both is the right answer, who will we serve first? If we say that we serve both groups equally, you may be sure that our congregation will wind up hopelessly focused inward. Why? The needs of the people inside will always be in our face. So I've never had anybody who did not, who was not a part of the church. When I was a worship leader, I never had anybody who was not part of the church ever complain about the music. They never complained about the volume being too loud or the selection of songs or 7-Eleven songs or any of the stuff that I heard from people inside the church. Uh, so if we say that we serve both groups equally, the people inside the church are the ones who are in our face, and we will just almost automatically defer to giving them more attention than we do the people who are outside who don't yet have a relationship with Christ because they don't, they don't complain about stuff. They don't have anything to say to us. Uh, so I like really simple stuff. I'm a big fan of that. So one way to think about the purpose of the church is we're called to make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Uh, you've heard that if you've been any had any connection to exponential. You've heard them talk about that. I have another way. I like to talk about two pillars of the Great Commission. We're called to reach lost people for Christ and grow believers to maturity in their faith. Um, I, I really believe that that's the purpose of the church. That's the mission that God's called us to. And then out of that comes all the other things that, that happen. As we reach lost people and we grow believers to maturity in their faith, congregational care happens, uh, programming ministry happens, those other kind of things happen uh, because mature believers want to care for the body and reach out to lost people. So that's just how I think about it. I like, I really like simple a lot. So mission, loss of focus on mission, why we're here, what we're about, why we exist is one hot spot. I just see a lot of that missing in our churches. Second hot spot is relationships between boards and lead pastors. This is just not working effectively in lots of churches. I often encounter churches where both the lead pastor and the board do not understand how effective boards function. This lack of understanding has some really clear implications. Um, a board that is over controlling of the pastor. I, I can't tell you how many times I have met with a church board that all they're concerned about is controlling their pastor and not let him or her do anything that they don't approve. And it's just a controlling situation. That's happened a lot. A pastor who runs over the board. There are other situations where the pastor just overwhelms the board and just has a strong personality and just disregards the board and runs over them. That, that's another dysfunction that happens. Lengthy meetings that deal with minutia and minor details versus focusing on the mission. I have two stories to tell you very quickly. I, I sat in a board meeting at a church in Michigan, was not a Wesleyan church. I timed it. They spent 20 minutes discussing the color of a postcard that was going to be sent out to advertise a, a VBS event that was coming up soon. After listening to them for 20 minutes, I was a guest at the meeting there to talk about things like this. And I just, I just asked the chairman of the board, I said, do you mind if I speak into this issue for a minute? And he said, no, feel free to go ahead. And I just, I kind of laughed and I said, do you really think it takes this much brain power to decide the color of a postcard that's going to be mailed out? And everybody looked at me and kind of laughed and kind of got sheepish. And they said, no, probably not. Uh, why don't we just let the BBS committee decide that? 
And I said, that's, that's probably not a bad idea. Why don't you do that? And that's what they did. 20 minutes got spent discussing that. I was in another board meeting where they had had a construction pro, uh, program not too long before this. And out in the back of the church, behind the church, there was a sand pile that had been left from the construction thing. And they spent a long time discussing whether they should move the sand pile from where it was to this place or to this place or to this place or to this place. Who was going to move it? How were they going to move it? Were they going to have a front end loader? Were they going to have somebody come in with whatever? And, and, and I thought, wow, you really want to spend your board time talking about that. And they did. That's exactly what they did. Uh, so those are two examples, uh, color of a postcard and moving a pile of sand. Uh, those are just not good ways uh, to spend time in a, in, a, in a board meeting. So what are some proposed solutions to that? Number one, use of the Carver governance model. You might want to read the book Winning on Purpose by John Edmund Kaiser. Now, some people who read that book feel like it's, it's a book that's built to uh, give a pastor way more power than any pastor should have. If you read it that way, that's, that's a misunderstanding of the book. Uh, it's a very healthy balance of accountable leadership. It's empowered leadership with boundaries. And so just that would just be one solution. Number two, uh, the design of the agenda. Can you create an agenda that helps you with this? Um, so what I do when I, like right now, I'm leading this uh, an interim pastor thing at Red Cedar Church in Rice Lake, Wisconsin. We have a prayer time. We have a leadership study. We have a consent agenda. And here's what the consent agenda is. The routine items of the board are all included in the consent agenda, and they're sent out to the board a week ahead of time. The finance reports, all the committee reports, the minutes of the last meeting, any things that are going to be sort of routine things. And when we get to this point in the meeting, somebody makes a motion to approve the consent agenda and all the reports and items that are in the consent agenda get approved in one shot. Now, if there is a need to discuss one of those items or something, you can ask to remove it from the consent agenda, but you've had it a week ahead of time. You've had a chance to read everything in there. You've had a chance to ask questions of committee chairpersons or of the treasurer or the business administrator or the lead pastor, whoever, so that you've had a chance to ask questions and then approve that all at one time. Then next, we, do, we deal with study items. These are things that you want the, the board members to be praying about, thinking about, reading about, studying, to make a decision about at some other point in the future. So for example, at Red Cedar, we just um, did an employee handbook. And we gave that to the board ahead of time and let them have a, a discussion and a study time with that, and then brought it back as what our next thing is, as an action item. Action items are usually things that have been study items, and the board is now ready to make a decision about those things. So action items, and, and one of the things that this does is it allows time for people who are processors, who like to think about things ahead of time. And if in the course of a study item discussion, there's a sense in the room that everybody's on the same page and you're ready to move ahead, somebody could make a motion to say, I'd like to move this from a study item to an action item tonight. And you can do that. But it, it just gives you room to study things, pray over things, discuss things, and then decide things at the next meeting. Uh, the next thing is just general information. What, what do the board members need to know about upcoming events, calendar information, uh, th that kind of stuff. So th that's just sort of a way to help deal with that. When I say that the role and relationship between a lead pastor and a board, uh, I see a lot of it not working well. Sometimes it's adversarial. Sometimes it's just dysfunctional. Uh, I recently had a, a, a young pastor. It was his first time to be a lead pastor at a church. He called me and he said, Jack, I just left our, our first board meeting since I've been at this church. And he said, when I walked in the room and I, and I got to the, to the table, the board members looked at me like, like I'm supposed to know what we're doing here, what this meeting is for. And how, he said, I didn't have any idea. 
I didn't know what to do at a board meeting. I didn't know how to function. Can you help me? And so we spent some time talking about, you know, how the board should work. We have things like that that are just innocent, not knowing for sure how to do anything, all the way from there to very adversarial relationships that, that need to be reined in and healing needs to take place and so forth. We want to see a healthy lead pastor board relationship for the purpose of accomplishing the mission that God has called us to. So that's an, an area of hotspot that I see. Third one, a need to understand the cost of not dealing with conflict. Uh, a few years ago, I was working with a church that um, the lead pastor who had left the church told me, I know there are some things at the church that I should have dealt with, and I just didn't do it. And now the next person coming in is going to have to deal with it, and it's going to be really hard. There's a price tag for that. So church leadership, Chris Conrad, our regional superintendent here, says church leadership often suffers from terminal niceness. We want to be nice. We want to be kind. We want to be gracious. But Ephesians 4 is more where we really need to be. We need to speak the truth in love. You can put both of those together. Um, we easily recognize the price of dealing with conflict. It's much harder to measure the cost of not dealing with it. Much harder to recognize it. So what are the results of not dealing with conflict in a healthy way? Um, yeah, loss of morale among the team. Everyone knows this thing needs to be addressed and are asking, why aren't we dealing with this? Everybody knows that. Uh, and so it just, it causes a loss of morale, a loss of respect for leadership. When others realize the leader or leaders are not willing to deal with these issues, they lose respect for their integrity and for their leadership. That's one of the price tags of not dealing with it. The unhealthy person continues to exert undue influence and leads the church into greater and greater dysfunction. Quite often, it's the squeaky wheel that gets the oil. We've all heard that phrase. It's the loudest person that, that gets attention and that sort of thing. And we need to be able to not have that happen. Number four. Gifted leaders and high-capacity leaders leave, and new high-capacity and gifted leaders are not attracted to this kind of team. They don't want to be a part of something where you're not willing to deal with the difficult conversations. Uh, so some examples of that. There was an administrative person at a church that I was working with a few years ago. Some of you will remember, if you're old as I am, which uh, Chris Conrad talks about me being as old as Moses, um, little three-and-a-half-inch floppy disks that we used to stick in computers. Well, this lady had a, a computer that still had one of those disks in it. And so every time somebody offended her, she would pull out her little floppy disk and stick it in there and record it on such and such a date, so-and-so did this, and it really offended me. And she was keeping records of this. And then something would come up and she would pull it out and remember and say something and and I'm keeping track and keeping records of this. Well, the lead pastor was aware she was doing this. Other staff members were aware that she was doing it. And it was creating uh, a loss of morale, a loss of respect uh, for the leadership of the church. And so uh, at, a, at a staff retreat, we asked the staff of the church to create a staff covenant. And they, it, it was, uh, we want to be a part of a staff that prays for, we, for one another. We want to be a part of a staff that cheers for one another. And as I was reading through the things that they came up with, one of the things that they came up with said, we will talk to each other, not about each other. And I thought, well, that, that's coming from somewhere. And that's when I heard this story. So after they created this staff covenant, the lead pastor asked everybody on the staff to review the covenant and sign it and agree to that. And he, to his credit, sat down with this lady and said, you know this thing about talking to each other, not about each other? You're going to need to get rid of that three and a half inch floppy drive and stop keeping track of things. And I just want to call you to live at a different level. 
she broke into tears and she said, you're absolutely right. Thank you for challenging me on this. I will sign this staff covenant. And to her credit, she got rid of the three and a half inch floppy drive and never did that again. What a great blessing. But in the prior to dealing with it, there was a lot of cost. But once it got dealt with, there was victory. There was celebration. There were really good things. Um, a staff member in another situation who continued to have sideways conversations undermining the board and leadership of the church. In this particular church, uh, there was a staff member who just got mad about some stuff and started talking to other people on staff, started talking to board members, started gossiping. And, uh, and now you start to see the erosion of unity in the staff. You start to see questioning in the board. You start to see all these things that happen. And the price tag of not confronting that was very, very high. You don't want, you don't want that to happen. Uh, a staff member who didn't perform their duties, the lead pastor continued to rescue the person inadvertently, teaching the rest of the staff that they would not be held responsible for doing their job. So I'll give you an example of that at this particular case. Uh, this lead pastor had told the worship pastor, I want you to form a creative team to plan our worship services and and just bring a greater level of creativity to that and so forth. Well, after four or five weeks, that team had still not been formed. So the pastor sat down with the worship pastor and said, what's up? Let's get the team formed. Four or five weeks go by. The team does not get formed. And so the pastor just says, I'll just form it myself. And so he did. He formed the team himself and just let the worship pastor get away with not doing his job. And so when he was telling me that story, I... I just looked at him and said, does the worship pastor still have a job? And he said, yes. And I said, why? He's not doing his job. And, and other people were frustrated that he was able to not perform his duties and still everything was going along just fine. Um, and it made them have a loss of morale because the worship pastor kept getting rescued. Well, that's the kind of stuff that happens when we don't deal with conflict. So one other just quick illustration of this, I often see smaller churches in particular who don't have a very good website or no website at all. <clears throat> and I will say to them, you know, it would be really helpful to your ministry if you had a really good solid website. And they will say to me, do you know how much it costs to have a website? And I will say, yes, I do. It's expensive. It does cost money. And you can actually go to some companies and get a quote on how much it costs to, to bring your website up to speed. We could actually get a real number that's a quote. But then I will say to them, do you have any idea what it's costing you to not have a good website? So the first time somebody goes on your website and it's September and you're still advertising last Easter's Easter services, they're going to say, I can't trust the information on there. So I will not use their website. In today's world, people almost always visit your website before they visit your church. There's a cost to not having that done, having that effective. It's harder to measure that cost than it is the cost of getting a good website. The cost of not doing something is always more difficult to measure than the cost of doing something. But with conflict, with websites, with other things, it's worth overcoming that. Okay, let's go to the, the next hot spot. A need to build a strong understanding about the authority of Scripture. I don't remember just when this was, but a few years ago, I read a Barna study that at that time said 65% of high school students in evangelical churches do not believe the Scripture is the authoritative word of God. Well, if that's true, that's definitely a problem, because if, if, it, if we don't believe Scripture is the authority, where do we go to get a basis for making decisions about things? In my opinion, many of the things that are dividing and weakening our churches are because we're using human logic instead of teaching the Word of God as the authoritative source of truth. So it seems logical that God would want everyone to live in whatever way they think is best for them. That certainly is a value in our world. If it feels good, do it. If it's good, if it's right for you, it's okay. That kind of stuff. Scripture does not teach that. 
that are we willing to embrace what scripture actually says? Uh, it seems logical that God loves everyone so much that he would never allow anyone to go to hell. Scripture does not teach that, but we seldom talk about it. Um, the logic of that feels really good. It's just not biblical. It seems logical that I should be allowed to express my sexuality in any way I want and in any way that gives me pleasure. Scripture does not teach that. And are we willing to, in a spirit of grace and kindness, embrace what Scripture does teach? Um, it seems logical that God has blessed America, and therefore it follows that being a true American means being a Christian. Scripture does not teach that. We are members of a different kingdom, the kingdom of God. And in this last year, this particular issue has been a really hot spot in local churches in the United States. It's been a huge deal where we get Americanism and Christianity confused. Now, I'm an American, and I love being an American. I'm thankful for America, but I am first and foremost a member of the kingdom of God. And as a member of the kingdom of God, how does scripture teach me that I should be a good citizen in my nation? That's the perspective that I believe should be there, but this has gotten really confused because of our loss of authority of Scripture. It seems logical that, and you fill in the blank, you may be dealing with some other thing or issue or stuff in, in your setting, and you can fill in the blank, and the question that I would ask is, what does Scripture teach? Let's go back to the truth of Scripture to figure out where we should base our, our truth and our decisions and our ethics and our morals and our principles. It comes from the authoritative word of God, which the world does not view as authority. But my concern is more and more and more in the church, we're also not viewing it as that authority. So people are more willing to defend a worship style than they are the word of God. In John chapter 4, that says, those who worship God must worship him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't say in organs or choirs or, or guitars or drums or acapella or Gregorian chants. It doesn't say any of that stuff. It just says we need to worship God in spirit and in truth. Are we willing to actually go back to scripture for our basis of how we do things? So that's a hot spot that I see uh, in local churches. What are some proposed solutions? Spend intentional time teaching people about the authority of Scripture. Do a message series uh, about it. Um, spend intentional time teaching people how to read and understand Scripture for themselves. Uh, so I'm going to give you this, this illustration um, that may seem really goofy, but I think it'll illustrate the point. So let's suppose that one of you invited my wife and myself to come to your home for dinner, and we come. And you're, because you're gracious and kind, you would have prepared a very nice meal, and it would be very tasty. It would be awesome. And we sit down at the table, and perhaps you lead us in prayer, and, and we start to dig in. And my wife and I just sit there and don't, don't pick up any utensils. We just sit there. And after a couple of minutes, you look at us and say, is anything, anything you need? Are you okay? What, and what's happening? No, we're fine. It's, it's all good. And uh, so you sit there a few more minutes and you keep eating and we haven't eaten anything. We're just sitting there. So you say to us again, are you sure everything's okay? Is there anything you need? How can we help? And we say, oh, no, everything's fine. We're just waiting for you to feed us. And they would, if that happened, you would look at us and say, that's just weird. Why would you expect us to feed you? You've got food on your table on your plate, you've got utensils, you know how to use them. Why would you expect us to feed you? That's just bizarre. Well, I wish I could see all of your faces right now and have you raise your hands, because I'll bet every person on this webinar has had somebody in your church say, I left that church over there because I wasn't getting fed, or they complain to you because I don't feel like I'm getting fed at this church. You've probably had that happen. Well, 
how do we help people learn how to read and understand scripture for themselves? When we make our messages so academic and so complicated with detailed Greek and Hebrew and historical context of things, the people in the pew are sitting there saying, I would have no idea how to get all that stuff out of scripture. So it's not going to be my job to understand scripture. I'll just wait for the pastor to feed me. Well, in, at Red Cedar Church, where I'm serving right now in this interim pastor role, we decided to address that. So we had a sermon series called Pick Up a Fork. And what we did is we used the book of Philippians, which has four chapters in it, and we did a four-week series. And so the first 20 minutes or so of the message was taking chapter one and just teaching chapter one, just teaching that to the people. And then the next 15 minutes or so was spent showing the people in the congregation how we came up with that information. Where did we go to learn that the Greek said this? Where did we go to learn the historical context of this book? And so forth. If you've seen any of the videos from uh, Bible Project, um, that's a great tool. And then we had a, a little notebook that we created for all the people in the congregation, and we taught them a five-point Bible study method that they could use on their own, and we showed them how that worked in Philippians chapter 1. Did the same thing in Philippians chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and then the week after that on a Monday night, we had a Monday night gathering for anybody that wanted to dig deeper in learning how to understand and apply that five-point Bible study tool for their own learning. And we just called it Pick Up a Fork. We want you to be able to pick up a fork and feed yourself. So we're going to teach you the scripture, and then we're going to teach you how we learned to teach you the scripture. That the series was very well received. And it's something I would just encourage you to give some thought to. How can you equip the people of your congregation to have better access to God's word themselves? So that, that's another hot spot. So here's another one. Willingness to be lifelong learners and fully embrace the mission over the methods. We often hear older people uh, are hard. It's hard to get older people to accept change. I'm going to tell you right now, that's true. It's also true for younger people to accept change and for middle-aged people to accept change. Here's a principle that I want to tell you. People don't resist change. They resist loss. And if you tell a younger person that you want to make a change that causes them to feel like they're going to lose something, they're not going to like that change. If you tell an older person they're gonna, you're going to make a change and they're going to lose something by that change, they're not going to like that change. So how do we combat that? Well, a willingness to be lifelong learners and fully embrace the mission over the methods. I have four kids, and I have said many times, I, I am not a fan of country music. I just don't like country music, which as many of you perhaps love. It's the number one listened to music in America. I just am not a fan of that. But here's what I'll tell you. If I believed that having worship music in a country music format would help people come to know Jesus, would help people be introduced to a relationship with Jesus, I would learn country music. I would learn how to love it. I would embrace it. If doing Gregorian chants would help people come to know Jesus, I hate Gregorian chants. I would learn Gregorian chants, and I would teach it to our people I'd do whatever because the mission is way more important to me than the methods. Andy Stanley, I think, is a person who said we should marry our mission and not marry our methods. Now, here's, here's the deal. Um, so right there, Andy Stanley, I just uh, had that quote right in here. We must be married to our mission and not to our methods. Uh, we often have conflicting values with this whole thing. Doing things a certain way is more valuable than bearing much fruit. We value the method more than we do the fruit. The conflicting value to that is bearing much fruit is more important than doing things a certain way. I'm a fan of that second statement. What does it take to bear fruit? If it's legal, moral, ethical, and biblical, I'm willing to embrace that method. 
If I don't like it, I'll learn to like it. I'll develop a, a competency with it, whatever I have to do, because bearing much fruit is more important than doing things a certain way. Um, I want to give you an example of this. I, I wish like crazy I could find this cartoon because I would show it to you, but I have not been able to find it. I saw it a few years ago, and I have never been able to find it again. The first frame in the cartoon is the Women's Missionary Society here in the United States at a church taking sheets and tearing them into bandages, into, into strips, and rolling them into bandages. Then they take the bandages in frame two, put them in a barrel, and in frame three, the barrel is shipped to a hospital in Africa. The last frame in this cartoon showed the Women's Missionary Society at the African church opening up the barrel and taking the strips of cloth out and sewing them into sheets. Well, how silly is that? How ridiculous is that? Well, it happens a lot in our churches. And if I were to talk to the Women's Missionary Society in the United States side of that, they would say, we're doing this because that's the way we've always done it. They have embraced the method. They have not embraced the mission. And that's not to cast any stones at a women's missionary society. It could be the choir. It could be the worship team. It could be children's ministry. It could be anything where we embrace the method more than the, than the, than the mission. So that's just an example of, of how conflicting uh, values work. The hot spot, uh, this hot spot brings together a few of the other hot spots. Number one, the focus here is not on mission, but is usually on tradition, okay? Boards often don't know how to prioritize mission over methods. Here's a phrase that I use a lot with boards. Boards often have meetings that deal with complaint management instead of mission accomplishment. Many of you have probably sat in board meetings that you spend a significant amount of time discussing complaints of people about whatever it is, about the worship ministry, about the facility, about kids ministry, about something a youth pastor did or whatever it might be. Boards sometimes don't know how to prioritize mission over methods. Sometimes it's hard to address the conflict with a person who is valuing the method more than the mission. So this is that conflict avoidance thing. So we just avoid it and we let them create issues in the church by not addressing it. But what they're doing is they're valuing the method more than the mission. And the fourth thing is quite often these methods are based on tradition and not on authority of scripture. Okay, so that kind of brings all of these hotspots together. Uh, final interesting observation, almost all of the what's which is the mission, it, it's the what, we should all worship God, that doesn't talk about how, are in scripture. Almost none of the hows are in scripture. So for example, uh, everybody in this webinar would agree, I'm sure, that if when we gather as a body of believers, we should have a meaningful experience of worshiping God and edifying him and lifting him up and worshiping him, praising him, celebrating God. Everybody would agree with that. That's in the Bible. Almost none of the how to do that are in the Bible. It doesn't talk in the Bible about you have to do this a cappella, or you have to do this using guitars, or you have to do this using choirs, or whatever. It doesn't talk about the hows. It just says, worship God in spirit and in truth. There are examples in Scripture of people worshiping in many different ways. The what is in scripture, the how is often not. But you know what? We almost always disagree and divide over the hows way more often than the what's. That's just the reality of observations that I see in the church. Most church divisions are not over the what, they're over the how. Um, the worship experience, I just shared that example with you about the, the whole worship experience. So that's kind of the, the picture of some hot spots that I see in the church today, some things that I often encounter when I get asked to come into a church in a consulting role, things that churches are wrestling with and dealing with. And so let me um, invite you to uh, pose questions or whatever it be. I'll stop sharing my screen and let's go back. To, I don't know if Joel is still there. Yeah, he's there. 
and let's see what we come up with. All right, I've got several questions sent through the chat here. So thank you so much, Pastor Jack. That was fantastic information. Uh, wrote down a lot well, of things. <laughs> All right, we'll just kick it off here. Got a couple of questions right off the bat about their boards, <laughs> as you might imagine. All right, how do I criticize my boss when I speak <laughs> about my board? In other words, how do I tell them that they're wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And there are some healthy ways to do that. And it's also dependent upon the emotional key, the EQ, the emotional quotient of the pastor themselves. So what is your is your attitude in sharing that an attitude of criticism? Uh, or is it an attitude of helping somebody get better? So a, fr a friend of mine uh, has done quite a bit of speaking at Promise Keepers. And he was telling me one day that when you walk off the stage, you go backstage at Promise Keepers, and there's a team of people who right there who critique your message immediately. Oh, wow. And they tell you this illustration was too long. This was not a good illustration. This was fantastic. You should say that again next time. But they debrief immediately. And one of the statements that he made was, I knew that everything they were saying was in an effort to make me better. So it was easy to receive it because it wasn't offered with a critical spirit. So are you trying to make your board better? Are you trying to grow them? Or are you just mad at them? You're ticked off and you want to fire off a shot. <laughs> then you also have to create a culture where it's okay to have those kind of conversations. So at, at Red Cedar, um, I the very first time I met with their board, I told them that's the kind of relationship I wanted to have with the board where they could uh, give me constructive criticisms and I could give that to them. The very first time I did something that one of the board members didn't like, he asked to meet with me in my office. And he came to my office and told me what he wanted to meet about. And the very first thing I said to him, I called him by name and I said, so and so, the first thing I want to tell you is I really appreciate you coming and telling me this because I believe your heart in this is to try to make me a better leader and we need that in this church. Well, that immediately took the tension away from him. He said, man, I was nervous. I didn't know if it was really okay to come and say this or not. And when I responded by saying, of course, it's totally fine to say it. And I, I believe you'd be willing to let me say something like that to you if it was needed. And he said, yes. Well, over time, we've built that kind of a culture, that kind of a relationship. So your attitude and your perspective in saying it matters. And the culture that has been built can make it easier or more difficult to receive it when it's said. So there'd be lots of things we could talk about in how to build that culture. But that, that's what I would say to you. Um, make sure that your spirit in approaching it is one of making them better and not criticizing. Good point. Good point. Well, right on the heels of that, I've been a pastor for five years at this current church. What is the best way for me to approach my board to heal hurt feelings from previous arguments and disagreements? <laughs> I, I'm sure there's not any other church in the country that's ever had to deal with that, just yours. So, oh my goodness, that, that is such a common thing of a dysfunction between a pastor and a board. Sometimes you may need an outside party to come and help you navigate that. Somebody that can help um, get those issues out on the table in a healthy, non-critical way and help the two sides have a conversation uh, about that. Sometimes that's needed. Other times, you as the leader can probably bring that to the table. It just depends. Uh, you, you would have to discern um, if you need a third party or not. Quite often, it's helpful to have that third party. Uh, and it's somebody that's not biased either way, has no stake in the game, but it just is there to help you sort through what those issues are and how to think about them differently. I've had that in my own life, just on a personal level, uh, where I've had to, I had a conflict with somebody about whatever it was. 
and, and ask somebody, would you be willing to meet with the two of us? We're not working this out very well and we need some help. And so for example, um, I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this. I've had that with my wife. And so the third party becomes a counselor and we go together to a counselor to say, man, we, we've hit an impasse. We can't figure out how to get through this. Would you help us? And that other person helps us navigate that, helps us better see each other's perspective and that kind of stuff. Sometimes you need that with a board conflict like you're describing. Amen. All right, another question here in the Q&A forum. Do you know of any successful ministries that meet monthly for worship and perhaps having a weekly Bible study and or small group? Uh, I don't personally know of any place like that other than some things that happened during COVID, specifically for COVID reasons. Um, I, there's a whole variety of things that have happened as a result of COVID. Uh, but I don't know of anybody specifically intentionally using that specific format. However, here's something that I would tell you. We all know COVID has been really challenging. It's been really tough. There is a wonderful gift that COVID has given to us that we should take full advantage of. For the first time, people have said, people who are used to not changing have said, we have to be willing to think about doing church differently than we've done it in the past. What's the best way to do it moving into the future? When people are willing to ask that question, that's a mission-oriented question. What's the best way for us to reach people for Christ? And if it's not uh, four times a month on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock in gathered worship, what is the best way in our community, in our setting, with our situation, People are asking those kind of questions more today because of COVID than they were ever willing to ask prior to that. So I would encourage you to have some meaningful, strategic, mission-focused discussions uh, that, that focus on the mission and make sure the methods are serving the mission. Good stuff. Uh, next question here through the chat. What are the steps that you would recommend to help us move towards an outward focus as a church? What are the, I'm sorry, what are the specific steps you would recommend to help us move towards an outward focus in our church? Uh, first of all, let me, let me pause and go back for just a second. Sue, can you turn on your video just a minute, please? This is my colleague, Sue Teachman. I, I forgot to introduce her. Uh, we work together in the Great Lakes region. And it just dawned on me, are you aware of any churches that do the monthly gathering that with the question that was previously asked? Yeah, I, d I don't know of any, Jack. Unfortunately, I do not. Do you know of any other formats that are sort of the non-traditional format that somebody's doing or trying? The only one I know of is David Drury, who does his missional community or micro church or whatever, but that's in Indiana. So, yeah. Yeah, so there, there are things, that, yeah, I just I just happened to think about that and think maybe you've seen something or been exposed to something that I haven't. Um, so uh, let's, let's go on then. Joel, could you repeat that last question, please? Absolutely. What steps would you recommend to help our church be more outward focused? Yeah, um, step one is to go back to scripture. What does the Bible say? So here's one of the things that I do sometimes with a church board. It starts with leadership. We, we operate in the Great Lakes region with this philosophy. We believe everything rises and falls on Holy Spirit anointed leadership. Hmm. Starts with the lead pastor and it goes to the staff and the board. How are you leading? Uh, and, and that matters. And so one of the things that I often do with a, if it's a staff meeting or a board meeting or something like that, I will ask them this question. Do you truly convictionally believe that the Bible is the authoritative word of God? Mm -hmm. And if they say yes, then I will say to them, okay, then the things that we're facing, the challenges that we're dealing with, let's look there for what does scripture tell us we should be doing? And so then I will start with Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, the Great Commission. Scripture tells us, stay in the local church and don't tell anybody about Jesus. 
It does not say that. It says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples, baptizing, teaching them everything, all that stuff. And it's, it's an outward focused thing. Let's go to Acts 1.8. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth, is going out. That's in the Bible. Um, and then Jesus said in Luke 19.10, I have come to seek and save that which is lost. He, he did not say he came to hang out with all the people at synagogue. He did go to the synagogue. He spent time at the synagogue, but he went out from there. And so when I'm trying to move a church to think about that, I will go back to scripture and say, let's, what does God tell us in his word? And then I'm learning to do this. Uh, Sue is way better at this than I am. And she's helping me learn this. And a friend of mine, Blake Hicks, is helping me learn this. Instead of pointing my finger and preaching at him, say, you lousy suckers, you need to get outward focused. Or, which is what I would love to do sometimes. Is not very smart. <laughs> Don't win friends and influence people that way. Is ask questions. What do you think that scripture means? What, what do you think are implications of that? What, what do you see from that? And asking questions where you get them to give the answers. And if you can get them to say it, get them to recognize scripture is, is um, saying that it's way better than just telling them. Um, so pointing them to some passages of scripture and then joining together with them collaboratively. What do you think this means? What do you think would be some implications for our church? Uh, an, another area of places that I go with a question is, in the last two or three years, how many people can we name that have come to know Jesus Christ as a result of the ministries of our church? Mm. So yeah. one church that I asked that of their church board, I'm not making this up, it's a true story. Their board spent probably five or ten minutes discussing that and said, we've got the name of this one guy. 20 years ago who accepted Christ. And my response to that was, how do you feel about that? And they said, terrible. We feel awful. And I said, well, what do you think we should do about that? Question. Well, we've got to be more focused on people outside the church instead of ourselves. And they began a journey of learning how to change their focus. Mm -hmm. um, so those kind of things are authority of scripture, and then just the practical thing, how many people have we had baptized? How many people have come to know Christ? And ask them to reflect on those questions. And, and how do they feel? Do they feel like they're being effective? Are they carrying out the mission that God's called us to? Let, let the leadership of the church wrestle with those questions. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Another question into the Q&A forum here. What are some simple things to help the LBA think outwardly as a part of the board meeting? Well, at the top of my list would be two things, a leadership lesson every board meeting and how you create the agenda. I just don't allow uh, discussions at a board meeting that, that go off the rails. I just don't do that. And so when somebody starts to do that, rather uh, I'm learning to ask questions instead of make statements. So I'll say to, when somebody starts complaining about something or whatever, I will say something like, board, you've heard what so-and-so said. Do you believe that's a board level discussion? Do you believe that's something that the board needs to discuss? And almost every time they'll say, no, we were just picked off about it and wanted to talk about it for a while. I say, well, good, go see a counselor. <laughs> you know, Go talk to somebody else about it. Go talk to the cows about it. But, it's not a board level discussion. And, and just ask them that question. Now you have to do some training, some leadership teaching to help them know what board level discussions are, or they might say, yeah, I think it is a board level discussion and it's moving a sand pile. And that's clearly not a board level discussion. The, the head trustee can decide that, just put it somewhere, get it out of the way. Um, but you have to do some teaching. So leadership training with the board uh, is, a big, is a, a big deal. And then how you create the agenda, that consent agenda, 
um, I, I'll never forget this when I was at Central Wesley, and this was years ago, and it was a, I don't know, it was a three or four million dollar budget or something like that. And I happened to be in attendance at the board meeting when they were talking about approving the budget for the next year. And somebody wanted to change the library budget by $5 a week. And I just thought, what in the world, in a $4 million budget, you want to talk about $5 a week, go get a life somewhere. That's what I wanted to say. Now, I didn't say that, but I, that's what I was thinking. That, that's just a foolish discussion. Yeah. So helping them learn, that's just not a board level discussion. So uh, training, teaching, equipping them with leadership training, creating an agenda that identifies study items and action items. You spend time studying things. You don't try to ram things down people's throats, but you spend time studying uh, together. So at Red Cedar, just because I'm there right now, I can give you a, an example. We have a ministry called Red Cedar Rooms, and it's kind of like an online service at another community where we pipe in the service from the main campus to a small gathering people in another community. Well, the board was talking about the philosophy of that. They weren't talking about which projector to use and projecting it on the screen. They were talking about the philosophy of it, communities that we should reach. What's the mission behind it? Are we seeing transformed lives? That was a study item. And then it became an action item. We're ready to launch a new Red Cedar Room in Siren in a community that's an hour away from Rice Lake. So keeping them at, at 30,000 feet instead of 5,000 feet, um, those two things will help you with that. So leadership training and the way you create an agenda. Okay. All right, next question. I'm a pastor and I'm thinking about applying to Wesley Seminary to start my MDiv. What advice would you have for me? Go for it, man. <laughs> good answer. Good answer. Yeah, I, I, I'm not getting paid anything to tell you that. <laughs> I had a very good experience with Wesley Seminary. And um, uh, I, I would just encourage you, there are some very good thinkers there. Uh, there are some people who will challenge your way of thinking. I, I'll tell you this, it's a lot of stinking work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. Um and I don't know what age the person is who's thinking about doing that, but I did not uh, decide to do my master's. And I don't remember now. I was maybe 58 or 59 or 60 or something, and I decided to do it. That's not a good idea. Uh, I should have done that a long time ago. And But I would really encourage you to do it. I think you will be in a community of people that will stretch you. You'll be exposed to things that are happening. You'll get good, solid theology and you'll get practical ministry experience. Wesley Seminary is different than some seminaries because they're not just theoretical. Even things like doing stuff like this is just practical ministry. And Wesley Seminary is trying to make that happen. So yeah, I would encourage you to go for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got two more questions, if you have time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, Let's say I'm in charge of our church website. We definitely need help. Are there any companies that you would recommend that would be willing to help us? <laughs> Sue, <laughs> you, you have some thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, there is a, we have a gal in our uh, district region that kind of does it on the side. So I'd be happy to put her email up there and you can reach out to her. I know that there are actually several organizations that do that. Jack, you just had somebody reach out to you too, Anne uh, Chansky. And, 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 yeah. Yeah. Well, Live Design is one place that, uh, is that the name of it? Yeah, I believe so. And what's the name of the one that Journey Church uses? Uh, yeah, I can't remember who that is, Jack, off the top of my head. I'll tell you what, we could we could find li live design, I think is the name of one of the companies. I'll be honest with you, they're a little bit more expensive. Okay. Yeah. The company that that uh, Sue's home church is Journey Church, and they use a company for some help with their website. And I'll bet we could find out and and if anybody wants to know, uh, you could you could uh, let us know. 
in fact, let me let me share my screen again for just a second. Yeah, uh, and I know you can you can reach out to colleges too and find a student or something that's studying, uh, you know, communications and graphic design or something who probably has website experience. That's a great great way to do it. Great. That is, and sometimes some of the schools have students who need to do an internship. True. And they they benefit from it, and you do too. I put this screen back up here because it has my email address and my cell phone number. Okay. Uh, if you if you have a question like that, if you want to shoot me a text or an email, uh, I'll try to find out an answer to, to reply to you. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. I am one final question. So I love the idea of having a staff covenant. How many items were on that? And can you give me uh, any ideas of what other items were included? Yeah, in fact, if you want to send me an email, whoever asked that question about that, I will send you some samples. Okay. There's typically seven to 10 items on it. Um, it there's not a lot. If you make it 20 items, nobody remembers it. Uh, but if, if things that are on there are things like, uh, you're answering the question, what describes the staff that I want to be a part of? So what am I going to covenant together to do? Well, we want to be a staff that pray together. We want to be a staff that has fun together. We want to be a staff that works hard. We want to be a staff that produces ministry fruit. Like that one church, we want to be a staff who talk to each other and not about each other. Um, there, there's a variety of statements that, co that come into those. I will gladly send you some samples if anybody wants them. Excuse me. Um, so I'll take my, is anybody who needs my email address, they've had it long enough probably to get it. So I'm gonna stop the share. But yeah, that's, I'd be happy to share that with you. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Pastor Jack and Sue. I appreciate you joining us so much. It was great to meet you as well. And I want to thank everybody who tuned in today and those that will be watching this uh, via recording. We will post this to our social media properties tomorrow, as well as our YouTube channel. I uh, would also like to thank Wesley Seminary uh, for sponsoring today's event. If you are considering seminary, you have any questions, you're feeling the call and you're just not sure, give us a call. We'd love to chat with you. This is a great time to uh, en enroll, to apply. So our enrollment counselors would love to talk to you at 877-673-0009, or you can email us at wesley at endwest.edu. Thank you, everyone, so much for joining us today. I hope you have a great rest of your day. And remember, we are Wesley, and you belong here. And you know, I, I say that every time, but we don't just mean it. You really do. If you're a, a pastor, you're one in your MDiv, your D-Men, you are a lay leader, you are a marketplace multiplier, and you're just wanting to go deeper, we'd love to chat with you and have any of those conversations. So thank you so much, Pastor Jack, Sue. Thank you, Joel. Appreciate it very much. Blessings on you all. Blessings. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.